This week, Doctor Strange tries to save the last bits of magic in the Marvel Universe, The Flash gives birth to a new speedster, and all hell breaks loose in Metropolis. What's up, everybody? I'm Stan, and welcome to Detail Comics, where I go over comics in detail. This is Shelf Appeal, where I go over the new pickups of the week and give you a little bit of insight as to whether there's something you should pick up, too. Make sure you stick around for the end of the video for the last five books, which are my five books that I recommend to everybody this week. But to start things off with, I'm going to go with a book that didn't even come out this week, and that's going to be Justice League 51. So Justice League 51 is really kind of a, an ongoing tale that picks up before really the Dark Side War ever really came about. And this is really showing Dick Grayson and his initiation into what would be or potentially be his role in the Justice League in the future. Overall, it's Batman kind of showing him the ropes and giving him an idea of his expectations. And it's a really great, it's a really great story for Dick Grayson himself. I really like this book and it leads directly into a book for this week and that would be Justice League 52. So this is the last book in the Justice League series for the new 52 and what this is, this is really a, a telling of Lex Luthor and his origin of the idea to become Superman and to take over the mantle of the now deceased new 52 Superman. So. You might question his motivations, but if you want to have an idea of where he's coming from mentally, uh, you, this is a book that you're going to want to pick up to help things make sense. Now we go from a story about Lex to a story about a gentleman named Lucas Stand. So Lucas Stand number one, which is produced by Boom Studios, this is a book written by Kurt Sutter, who did Sons of Anarchy. And what you find is that this is a very non-family friendly story, especially for the start. And it's, it's a very violent and... and mostly realistic telling of what can potentially happen to veterans, you know, the people that take care of our country as part of the armed services. After it gets past this very realistic and gritty origin story, I find that the book becomes a little bit contrived. It's a mix of, you know, like, they live with uh, a little bit of, like, Edge of Tomorrow, kind of like timey-wimey kind of stuff. I'm not really sure where it's going to go. I might give issue two a pickup uh, overall. I don't necessarily know if it's something that I'm going to grab on the regular because it didn't really grab me with this first issue. Then we get into a book that's been on my pull list for a while and was in danger of dropping off of it. However, Carnage number 9 really redeemed itself. Simply because Carnage, to me, was really supposed to be a horror comic book. And it was meant to kind of touch on those things, maybe get into like monster movie kind of habits. And it was meant to be not necessarily just a gore fest, but it's supposed to be like a thriller, suspense kind of uh, antagonist kind of book. And Carnage number 9 really brought that back into me. After kind of dealing with some of the plot pieces to get it moving to this point in time... It was very slow through the last few issues, but this one kind of stepped it back up and, you know, went straight ghost ship on this thing, so that's that's awesome. After the gore of Carnage, we kind of get into a guilty pleasure of mine, which happens to be Gwenpool. So Gwenpool number three dropped, and Gwenpool is... There's no real logical reason for me to be picking up Gwenpool, other than the fact that I find that the humor is... It's kind of funny. It's, it's very introspective. It's got a very caricature-like portrayal of the characters. But the art by Guerrero is awesome. The covers by Stacy Lee, they're awesome. And it's it's like mindless entertainment. The best part about this issue is the appearance by Doctor Strange, which is very topical. And so I really enjoyed that. I mean, it's a it's a book that I, I've got loose ties to. I just keep kind of going back to it because, you know, it's just like sometimes you just deserve a little bit of fun, and that's really all this is. It's just a little bit of fun. Then we get into another book that's supposed to be just a little bit of fun, and that is Deadpool vs. Gambit. So Deadpool vs. Gambit 1, this is a, a team-up book, so to speak, and you kind of get lost in the beginning of it because you're like, wait a minute, why, are, why is this happening? This isn't the dialogue you would expect between the two characters that are kind of basically destroying the entirety of New York. And it, you find out later that the motivations are what they are, but it's basically a, the origin story of how, like, Deadpool and Gambit kind of got into what's going to be this ongoing series, and it happens in a pretty entertaining way. Ultimately, you're going to end up singing Beyonce a lot after you read this book. Now we get into a book that I wasn't very sure of uh, when the Rebirth issue came out, and that is Aquaman number one. So Aquaman number one is... I find it to be a very good number one book. It's not quite as great a jumping on point as Aquaman Rebirth was, but Dan Abnett did a great job kind of relaying those motivations that came in Aquaman Rebirth number one, and you understand why Arthur Curry as a character wants to proceed down this road. 
the problem that I'm running into is that I still don't have enough compelling reasons for me to be like, yes, Aquaman is now one of my favorite books and, and I want to I want to read it all day long. You know, give me more. I still don't feel that way about Aquaman. It's probably not a fault to him. It's just that I haven't read enough to know that this is a character that I want to go down this road with. It's just not as appealing to me as other books are. Next, we get into the Batman boot camp that is Detective Comics. So Detective Comics 935 is the continuation of the story where we see Batwoman, Orphan, uh, Spoiler, Red Robin, Clayface, all becoming this kind of Bat Vigilante team that's been orchestrated by Batman to come uh, up against this overcoming force that is coming to them. And in this book, we actually see what happened to Azrael, which caused this kind of commotion and, and really created this need for Batman to bring people into the fray. There are some interesting turns and twists that come about, and you find out that some characters are a little bit closer than what you'd originally anticipated. But the end of the story, you know, this one that's being penned by James Tinney in the fourth, it, it seems that it's going to be going someplace. You know, the the final arc of this book is leading you in a direction where you're like, okay, regardless of Batman's intentions, these young vigilantes, whether they're ready or not, are going to have to go out and face this oncoming force. And that's something that I would be looking forward to in this book. Then, after a two-issue hiatus where she was gallivanting all over the Marvel Universe, we have the Mighty Thor. So Jane Foster's Thor returns in this book, and what we see is kind of a table setting. So Jason Aaron isn't quite jumping right into where things are going to go, because this is like Gods of Midgar kind of, kind of stuff, where we're focusing primarily on Earth. And what we see is Jane Foster kind of catching up to what was a evil superpower summit that didn't end quite the way that I anticipated, which is totally fine. It leads me in a good direction, and I'm really interested to see where that character is going to lead this new group of supervillains, especially after uh, Roxxon might be taking a bit more of a back seat in this kind of situation. So I think that this is going to lead to a very compelling story arc, especially based on what Jason Aaron has done with The Last Days of Magic and Doctor Strange. I mean, we're going to get to that. It's... It's awesome, but we're going to get to that. So I'm really excited to see what he's doing in The Mighty Thor and if he can pull off something very similar to that with Jane Foster. Now we finally made it to my top five books of the week and we start off with a strong one in Wonder Woman number one. So Wonder Woman is having some issues and ultimately she's trying to find out the origin of these issues, not just the origin of herself and you know her actual origin story getting past these lies, but ultimately she needs to find help. And this is a story that shows her reaching out, going to find help from an unlikely source. We see two stories being told in this book at the exact same time, and ultimately you find that Diana is going to a place where she wouldn't necessarily go there, ever, really, uh, without good reason. And it's because she needs help that she can't find anywhere else. Overall, I'm really excited to see where this goes, and then to see the contrasting story that's happening two weeks from now, or three weeks from now, I think it is, but it's going to be very compelling, and, and I've, I've, I'm really invested in where Wonder Woman is going to be going after this. Then we go from Warrior Goddess to the birth of Godspeed. So this is setting up this character, and it's really more of a backstory, and it shows what kind of person Barry Allen is and how he treats things. As the fastest man alive, he still has things that he can't get to. A man can't be everywhere at once. Uh, unless you read Kingdom Come, then I guess you can. But... Ultimately, this is one of those things where Barry Allen sees what happens in a situation where he comes up just short, and it imbues a close person to him with power similar to his, and it sets up a very intriguing story, because there's a lot of different motivations between the two characters. I'm interested to see how the interaction goes, and if it turns south, why it turns south, those kind of things. It, Joshua Williamson's doing a very good job setting this up. I'm very, I'm, yeah, I'm very happy about where this is going to go, and I'm, I'm excited to read it. Breaking his way into the top three is going to be the Totally Awesome Hulk issue seven. So the Totally Awesome Hulk this week is not dealing with the Totally Awesome Amadeus Cho. It is dealing with Bruce Banner, and Bruce Banner has been gone. He has been AWOL for months, and this is where we see what's gotten into him, you know, what's happened. This is a, a definitive story of how somebody that is identified with a part of himself, you know, put on a, a mask per se, that is, you know, given him a little bit of free license to be this 
kind of exposed, nerve, violent personality and how that impacts you when that ability, you know, when that personality is ripped from you. You don't have any time to cope with it. What do you do in response to that? And it's a very humanizing tale for Bruce Banner, uh, a character that's really kind of backseated himself to the inhuman part of him, not like literally inhuman, but the the monster inside the man. So I'm really excited about this, and I'm excited to see where the next issue goes and how it impacts Civil War II, because Civil War II issue two ended with a pretty serious cliffhanger that if you've read it, you're going to know what I'm talking about. And you're like, oh, wow, that's how he gets there. Then we get into my number two book, which is kind of a surprise because I really didn't like the book that came before it, and that's Action Comics 958. And Action Comics 958 is really just me saying, you know what? To hell with it. Embrace the chaos. And that's what I did, man. I embraced the chaos. And Metropolis basically becomes a war zone. So you have full-on doomsday. You've got Lex Luthor, Superman with his apocalypse armor. You've got Superman from the previous universe. You've got Clark Kent, who's like the new 52 Clark Kent, or not a new 52 Clark Kent. And Jimmy Olsen's like, dude, go do something. He's like, what, do you, what can I do? I'm Clark Kent. It's overall, this book just made for a really entertaining ride, like a roller coaster, man. It, you don't necessarily, you know that it's going to end at some point in time. You know that it's going to get back to normal. But right now we're just like, woo, you know, we're going through loops and dips and all that kind of stuff. And it's just like, cool, I'm on for the ride just to see, you know, where it ends up and if I can hold my stuff, you know, hold my lunch down and that kind of thing. And last but certainly not least is the Doctor, Doctor Strange number nine. So Doctor Strange number nine is really the Indiana Jones, the culmination of, of the Indiana Jones that was issue eight, going out to try and find all these magical artifacts that are going to tr give the, the magical people of the Marvel Universe one last fighting chance, you know, a chance to vanquish the empirical However, the embodiment, you know, the, the darkness within the Marvel Universe, which has been kind of like grouped into one spot thanks to Doctor Strange, that has, that's going to have a say in it. So this book did a great job setting up what's going to be the grand finale of the Last Days of Magic Saga, and it's going to be interesting to see what kind of consequences this culmination of conflict really brings to the Marvel Universe. I have to recommend it. Go back, read them all. I'm going to be doing a series um, on all of the issues. I'm going to do them three at a time. So that, that way I can try and get as many people into this book as possible because Jason Aaron and Chris Bocciolo are doing a phenomenal job. Uh, let me know uh, what you guys think of it in the, in the comments. I'm really excited and I want to know who's excited with me. So that's it for this issue of Shelf Appeal. Why don't you hit me up in the comments down below. Tell me what you thought of the books that came out this week. And as always, if you like what you see, hit the like button down below. And don't forget to subscribe to get more news and reviews for comic books, comic book movies, comic book TV shows and games, and anything and everything inside the world of comics.